Hey guys, how's it going? Back again, and I want to talk about the movie Blue Velvet. This is the Criterion collection. You see the C up there. Beautiful case that uh, it came with. It's Blu-ray, and it came with uh, a nice booklet. It's a slip cover there. It's got pictures from the movie, which I can go over. Um, but I watched this. Uh, I think for the second time a little while ago, about a week ago or so with my mom. And I always mention when I watch movies with my mom because I always want to try to give um, my mom's reaction, but then sometimes I forget, so it just sounds kind of weird that I'm just like, oh, I watched it with my mom, but whatever. <laughs> it's a very bizarre movie, and um, anyway, it's made by David Lynch. It's directed by David Lynch. If you don't know already, I'm a huge fan of David Lynch. He's actually my absolute favorite director of all time, and I'm completely biased when it comes to him. You can see the beautiful eraser head uh, poster in the background if you recognize what that is. Um, anyway, Blue Velvet. I think as strange as Blue Velvet is, it's also kind of straightforward, and it's one of his movies that I think an average audience can digest and enjoy. And, you know, I was thinking I should make, like, a spectrum for David Lynch movies because he has, like, The Elephant Man and, straight, and The Straight Story, which are based on true stories, which are pretty great, straightforward films. And then, you know, he has Eraserhead, which is, like, totally bizarre and not like any film that you've probably ever seen before if you haven't seen it. Um, and then Blue Velvet is kind of like in the middle there. Um, and then, you know, he has his, the TV show Twin Peaks, which I'm an absolute huge fan of. And this star is Kyle MacLachlan, who plays Agent Cooper. And um, there are a lot of similarities to Twin Peaks and Blue Velvet. And I, I'm thinking that Blue Velvet came out first, but I'm not sure. There are a lot of similarities. I realized that while I was watching this again. But man, do I just love this movie. And my mom enjoyed it. Uh, it's a crazy movie to watch with your mom. <laughs> there is a little bit of nudity in here. There's like sexual references. And it's, it's really dark. There's a lot of dark stuff in here. But uh, there's, there's glimmers of hope in there also. And um, I'm just kind of mesmerized by this uh, cover, the blue velvet, the curtain, uh, velvet curtain or whatever. I mean, I guess it's not, maybe not a curtain, it's, I guess it's her dress. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about the story, I'm going to talk about the ending and everything, and I'm probably going to butcher this a lot, but I think Kyle MacLachlan plays a high school kid, basically. And Laura Dern is in this movie, and she's one of David Lynch's go-to actresses. At least I know she's in Inland Empire, and she's in uh, Wild at Heart with Nicolas Cage. And I was just thinking about how crazy it is that David Lynch had has had a lot of great actors and actresses in his movies, like Nicolas Cage and like Anthony Hopkins, and um, I'm sure lots of others. And and he seems to have kind of made his own stars also in Kyle MacLachlan and Laura Dern. Um, who is the guy that plays... Oh, Dennis Hopper. See, I'm not sure off the top of my head what other movies he's in that might be popular, but maybe this is the main one. But he is great in this movie. Isabella Ro Rosalini. She plays Dorothy Valens. Basically, so Kyle MacLachlan, he plays a character named Jeffrey... Beaumont, Beaumont. He's basically walking around um, outside of town in the country or what have you, and, and fields, and he ends up finding an ear in the ground. Now I'll cut back to the beginning uh, because before all that, we get kind of an opening scenes of this town. I think it's called Lumberton, which is similar to Twin Peaks because it's a you know the small town of kind of like happy people, the small community in like a rural area where they they have lumber, they have the sawmill at Twin Peaks and then this town's called Lumberton and anyway 
there's a lot of beautiful sights, sought shots. Sorry, David Lynch is just a masterful director at what he wants to get across, and just the lighting and everything is just amazing. Um, at the beginning, I think we see like a white picket fence, basically, and red roses. I think, and they just on the Blu-ray, especially, they just like pop out. Like it looks like it's art. I mean, it is art, but it's like you're looking at a painting and you're watching a movie and. It's just, but it gives you a feeling of, you know, how wonderful and happy this town is and all the neighbors are talking and everything and <clears throat> tending to their gardens or whatever. And I think that uh, Jeffrey's dad's tending to his garden or something and he has a garden hose, but somehow like he gets like tangled up in the garden hose and it makes him like trip and then he gets like shocked or something. <laughs> I don't remember. Anyways, he has like a big accident, so he has to go to the hospital. And we see Jeffrey visit him later on, and it's like, uh, he's like in a halo, like his head, I think. Uh, it's like he, you know, took a pretty bad fall or whatever. Um, so we kind of feel for Jeffrey, and it's after that when he's walking around, wandering around, that he finds the ear. He also kind of, there's kind of like a random shed or some random junk in the field or whatever, and he like throws a rock. And that reminds you of Twin Peaks, you know, when Agent Cooper does his Tibetan method or whatever to, to get uh, clues, and he like throws rocks at a throws rocks at a bottle or whatever, and if he hits the bottle and breaks it, then it means something, whatever. But you kind of get that vibe from seeing both of those. You see that uh, early inspiration or whatever. Um, but I think it's during the scene with I don't know if it's at the beginning when his dad's tending to the garden I think so maybe after he crashes or maybe it's after Jeffrey finds the ear but I think it's like when his dad has the accident whatever anyways so I told you at the beginning we see all these beautiful shots the white picket fence the red roses everything the grass is green and bright blue sky and everything's just like popping with color and and, and we see like a a fire truck or maybe a lumber truck or something or an ambulance or something drive by and somebody's like hanging off of it on the outside and they're like hey like waving like everybody's smiling and it's just a lovely town well i think it's after his dad crashes he falls to the ground in the grass and, and there's like a yard sprinkler or maybe it's his sprayer spraying it's going off whatever and it kind of zooms in on the grass and it kind of goes deeper and deeper and I think what we see is like beetles or there's like insects and they're like underneath the grass and like there's like a tone and like he sets these tones not only with the visuals but David Lynch is also amazing with his sound effects and his music and you get this vibe to where you're like transitioning from this happy joyous place and this really dark like underworld like things that we don't see like what's happening under the ground and stuff and um and that's kind of like terrifying. He's like zooming in on these bugs and everything. Anyway, so Jeffrey finds this ear. And I think there's like ants on it or something. And then he finds like a random little paper sack that's like crumpled up near it. And then he like puts the ear in the sack. And he ends up like taking it to the police department basically. Um, and they're like, okay, we're going to try to find out. You know, you tell us where you found this and everything. And we're going to go to the site. And, um... And even, like, the police officer, when he tells them, he shows them the ear and everything, he's, like, smiling. He's like, oh, like, yep, that's an ear. Like, okay, well, we'll find out. He's, like, not shocked or anything, really. He's just kind of like, oh, delightful. Well, we find out Laura Dern, that character, um, her name is Sandy Williams. And she is the daughter of this police officer, this detective, or whatever part apartment he was there or the sheriff or whatever so she's his daughter um, somehow you know they go to find clues or something I don't know if they really find anything somehow Kyle is Kyle's character Jeffrey is interested in finding more he wants to dig deeper like he's like his own investigator and the, when we first see sandy williams she appears like from the darkness like when um 
Jeffrey's like on a dark street corner or something, and she kind of comes out of the darkness, and I think, you know, she, they kind of find out who each other are, you know, aren't you the boy with the ear and stuff, and she's like, well, my dad's, you know, the, the police officer, and uh, maybe, you know, I can find out, you know, some more details, you know, we can, I can help you, and we can figure this out. Well, she does, anyway, they find out that it is, um, uh, somehow related to this singer and um this woman this female singer and maybe she is um maybe there's murder involved or whatever i mean this is a human ear that they found okay <laughs> um doesn't necessarily mean that anybody's murdered they just they found you know an ear maybe somebody just got their ear cut off anyway he gets this crazy idea he works for like the local hardware place in town or whatever and gets this idea that he's going to get like a something that resembles like insect spray or actually insect spray and he's going to get a jumpsuit and he's going to go to her apartment he's going to pretend to be a bug uh, bug exterminator spray her apartment he's going to find a window or something to open so he can return later and search her place for food it's kind of like okay this is kind of suspicious like almost like criminal activity but it's like you just gotta roll with it it's like okay whatever he's young and He's really inquisitive or whatever. He wants to find out, get to the bottom of this. Well, they go through with this plan, and, and um, she's supposed to be in the car on the outside, and when the singer gets to her, or after so many minutes, oh, no, this is what's going to happen. Okay, so after so long, she's supposed to come to the door and pretend to be a Jehovah's Witness or something like that, and and knock on the door and try to talk to the singer to distract her and that's when he's already going to be in the apartment that's when he's going to look for something well uh, somebody else ends up coming before her instead of her uh, somebody, just a strange guy or whatever so he's kind of alarmed that the plane's kind of not going as he thought but he ends up find, finding a spare key like underneath the kitchen counter or whatever so he steals that, he pockets that key, and then he leaves. <laughs> so, uh, later on they're going to return, and this time she's supposed to be waiting out in the car, and and he's going to go there when the singer's like doing her routine at her show or whatever. She's gone, and Sandy is supposed to honk the horn like three times if uh, she sees her walking up to the apartment to give him like an advance warning to get out of there. So he goes up there, and he's kind of digging around or whatever, and she somehow, oh, he's like using the bathroom or something, and he flushes the toilet when she's coming up there, and he doesn't hear the honks, so she honks the horns, but the toilet's so loud or whatever, he doesn't hear the noise, so he doesn't know. But uh, all of a sudden, uh, he's by a closet, in the living room basically and and she's at the door you know he can hear her starting to come in so he freaks out and he gets into the closet she comes in and that's you know we see her she ends up getting on the phone and she's very distraught and stuff and she's saying you know mommy loves you mommy loves you and um you know she's talking to some man like yes okay frank whatever uh somehow she finds out that he's in the closet she gets a hint and uh i don't remember how but um so she finds him in the closet she has a knife and she's like what do you want what are you doing here why are you in my apartment she's like you know are you a pervert or whatever you like here to watch me like you want to make love to me and and uh then she's like take your clothes off <laughs> she like makes it like she's crazy and, you know, she wants to make him take his clothes off, and she's, like, kissing him, and she's like, do you like that? And, and, um, she wants to, like, make love with him, have sex, whatever, and this other guy ends up coming, who we get introduced to, and, uh, she's like, oh, he's here, and, like, she makes him get in the closet again really quick and hide. And this is when we're introduced to Dennis Hopper's character, Frank, who is an insane psychopath. Um, 
and it's horrifying what we witness with him. <laughs> he uh, he's very mean to her, and he's a very deranged, demented person. And he gets high off of some kind of drug that he inhales through like a face mask, and you see it in the trailer that's playing in the background. He puts on his mask and <sighs> he breathes in really deep, and then he's like, ah, like. And uh, he starts calling her like mommy and stuff. He's like, mommy, mommy, like. He's just like sexually deranged, violent, maniac. And, uh, well, she's wearing like a blue velvet um, gown or whatever, robe, I guess. And for some reason, he's like sexually turned on by that or something. And he like puts the velvet, the stuff in his mouth and. He's acting all crazy. He's absolutely nuts. Um, so I think I'm going to jump around. Because I'm trying to be like too detail oriented. Walk you through every step of the movie. But I'm trying to remember just. Basically this guy Frank. The psychopath has kidnapped her son. And her husband. Or her boyfriend. I don't remember if they're married. Whatever. But the father of her child. I'm thinking maybe her husband. Her husband is the one who lost the ear. He cut his ear off. Um, as a warning or as a... Just because he's deranged, I don't, I don't remember, but... He basically keeps her... You know, he, he has her kid and her husband or whatever kidnapped. So he can control her and do what he wants with her for whatever sick reason. You know, he likes watching her shows and he's turned on by the velvet or whatever. I don't know. Um, it is yeah he has kind of like a gang of friends that he's with too he's kind of like a leader of a little just a group of idiots there's the fire truck thing with the guy waving in the beginning well I don't remember exactly how it goes eventually Jeffrey and Frank run into each other, and, um, so Frank knows about him. So, anyway, uh, he goes, I mean, like, he goes back to her house, Jeffrey does, to find out more, whatever, it, and somehow Frank ends up showing up or something and, and catching him. He's like, hey, neighbor, like, you want to go for a ride? Like, let's go for a ride. Him and his buddies take Jeffrey out for a ride. He's driving like a maniac in some kind of muscle car. Jeffrey has a nice car in here. I don't remember if it's like a Charger or what it is. And then Frank's got a nice car, too. But they're driving around, and they take her with them, too. And they go to a place where he has some other friends, where he gets drugs or whatever. And that's where her kid's being held, and... And she gets to go into a room and see her kid and she's like no mommy loves you mommy loves you like uh, it makes it sound like the kids may be being brainwashed or thinking that she's abandoned him or whatever and uh, but in that scene where he goes to the house uh, he has this one friend that you see in the trailer and they play this song uh, the Sandman by uh, I don't know, is it by Buddy Holly or whatever? I should know this, but uh, it's an awesome song. But every time I hear the song, I just think of this movie now. So there are two really great songs in this movie. There's the Blue Velvet song. I don't know who actually sings that one. And then there's the uh, the Sandman song. And it's just a weird scene where his friend like starts just singing that song, and there's like a spotlight on him, and he has like this old style microphone, and this guy is kind of like a fruit kind of looks like a homosexual or something, but he's got like, I don't know, just like his face is painted or just the way that his eyebrows are or what, it's just uh, weird expressions on his face. And this is just what David Lynch is perfect at. David Lynch is like the king of surreal, and uh, this movie is very surreal, that's why I said it's strange. Not just with the dark plot and stuff, but just with the imagery and the sounds and everything combined, it gives you feelings like like a nightmarish feeling. <sighs> he's 
starts there so they after she gets to see her kid or whatever they go for a ride and, uh, he takes the mask and does the drugs again he starts hitting on the woman and Kyle's in the back and he's he's kind of like stop it or whatever he gets or he gets ticked off and he actually like punches Frank and then it's like okay well the crap just hit the fan now Frank just like slams on the brakes or whatever they get out of the car they hold him Frank gives him this big psycho spiel just they they play he hasn't played the the Sandman song again while he's talking to him and this Frank character is just crazy. I want to talk about it more. I'm just trying to go over the plot, and then I'm going to talk about more things, like individually, specifically, hopefully, if I remember, get to this. But just the stuff that he's saying to him, he's like, I'm going to write you a love letter. He's like, or he's like, you don't want me to write you a love letter. Like, you know what a love letter is? It's like a bullet to your head from my gun or whatever. <laughs> like, well, he ends up punching him and, like, beating the crap out of him. And so we, they leave him there. We see him later on, like, all bruised and stuff. You know, Sandy ends up seeing him later. Like, she doesn't want him to be involved in this anymore. She, like, wants him to stop. Um, she ends up telling him about a dream at some point that she had. Uh, that has something to do with doves or something. And you know, I, don't, I don't know. She saw doves, and she saw this light, or whatever. It's some kind of a hopeful dream. There's a lot of symbolism of like darkness and lightness and stuff. A lot of these bad things that happen happen at nighttime in the dark. Even when it when they turn off the lights or whatever, when it gets dark, Frank is like, "It's dark now," and like, "Okay, the mood is like changing." And that's like Twin Peaks too. Uh, in Twin Peaks, we even see at night, or we see like a traffic light, like go from like green to red or whatever, and it signifies like a change in something. David Lynch is just great in that, just just masterful with what he does. Anyway. There's other things that I've skipped around. Jeffrey kind of follows him and scopes out a place where he was at and somehow Frank's involved with one of the police officers there this, this other detective he's like a bad cop or whatever um, I'm not too sure if it's clear if he's like a bad cop or if he's really if he really is a bad cop or if he's uh, like an insider but he ends up leading the cops to Frank or whatever, and there's like a big shootout. Um, and he ends up going back to her apartment. And it's a really weird scene at the end. Her, uh, her husband that had his ear cut off or whatever is like laying in a chair, like dead. And then the bad cop is standing there, but he's like been shot in the head or something but he has like his police scanner on in his pocket but he's like standing and it's like is he dead or what like he's just standing there and the tv smashed in it's like okay what happened here and anyway frank ends up coming up in there and jeffrey takes the gun from that police officer he gets back in the closet and uh frank ends up coming towards the closet and he Jeffrey shoots Frank in the head and kills him. That's kind of the ending, and then after that we see everything happy again. Um, everything's good with uh, with Sandy and Jeffrey. Everything's good with the singer. She gets her son back, and uh, it's back to the white picket fence and the red roses. It ends like how it began. And I skipped a lot of stuff. Okay, the Sandy girl that's helping him investigate, she has a boyfriend. <laughs> at the time and she keeps seeing this guy and uh, there's a scene where the boyfriend sees them together so he gets really jealous or whatever and later on they get they're getting chased by a car and Jeffrey thinks that it's Frank he's like it's Frank he's on us but it ends up being her boyfriend and he's like drunk or whatever with his buddy and he's like I'm gonna kick your ass like for stealing my girl or whatever and they get to Jeffrey's house and that singer is there, like, standing on the porch, like, completely naked. 
and she's like help me jeffrey like she's distraught and it's just it's crazy um jeffrey gets kind of romantically involved with this singer she's like forcing herself on him and uh you know she has <coughs> she's kind of like a victim of abuse and she i get the vibe that you know like she likes the abuse she wants jeffrey to hit her uh so you know she kind of becomes accustomed to that i guess um that's the only way that she kind of knows affection or whatever is like abuse and when when sandy's boyfriend sees or her ex sees um the singer standing there on the porch he's like is that your mom like oh he's like i didn't know he's like i'm sorry i'm sorry like he leaves but like i said he's kind of rom romantically involved with the singer and so when she's standing there and, and she's like help me and she gets in the car and sandy kind of notices this that there's kind of a connection between them two but sandy kind of had this connection with him too and so she's like jealous and angry and sad and everything laura dern is a great actress and she's really young in this and there's a scene there's a scene where somehow she's like crying i don't i don't it might be because of this she might be upset at jeffrey because of this or whatever she's crying but she does like a <coughs> she does like a wide open mouth like cry like i couldn't even imitate it like she's like like really dramatic and it's like almost laughable but you almost you gotta love it too and i was thinking you know and frank's very over the top over the tr over the top emotions and stuff like that can be kind of comical but they're also kind of effective because i was kind of thinking like i did wrestling training for a little while because i love pro wrestling and i had the opportunity to get in the ring and kind of learn some things and i worked with some guys and they wanted to see like some expressions from me you know and they're like you know give us some expressions or whatever and I, I was really timid and everything I didn't really know you know what to do or whatever but I gave him like a wide-eyed stare like uh like he's like yes like that's it like you know be like over the top like okay uh so those over the top things like with Frank too like if if we we're gonna do a scene where somebody's angry and, and you're like I was like you know what I'm really angry like I'm just angry, you know. Or is it better to be like, oh, I'm pissed. I'm angry. <laughs> you know what? You get like the, you get the message across. But what I say is like, you know, when I see that's kind of like, oh wow, this is her crying, is like crazy. But I mean, that's real life too. I mean, there are people that are like that that are over the top with their emotions also. But man, Frank really makes this movie. The movie to me is really about the psycho. Frank, this Dennis Hopper character. This movie to me is, I think that David Lynch is kind of like underground because like the average viewers, the average movie watchers probably don't know about David Lynch. But at the same time, he is like popular like in the world of surreal or bizarre movies. So he's kind of like the, the average in a way. To me, he's like the king of that. But, so he's kind of like a household name he kind of isn't i think um i mean chances are a lot of people that i've met if i'm like hey have you ever seen any david lynch movies have you ever seen blue velvet or twin peaks or Eraserhead or you know they're gonna be like no i've never have any idea what you're talking about okay you know it's like have you ever seen like spider-man or batman they'll be like yeah whatever there's you know star wars oh yeah star wars blue velvet no don't have any idea what you're talking about But the reason I'm saying this is, to me, like I said, this movie is very approachable, even with all of its surrealism, but it, because it has like a linear story, which is easy to follow, um, it's just a dark story about the psycho, it's, it's a, it's a mystery, it's a drama, and to me, it's like a classic, and this should be a lot more popular, this should be a lot more widely known. I was trying to think of, because just Frank as this psycho is just phenomenal. 
and you know him using the gas mask and his expressions and there's so many quotes from him and stuff that I haven't really mentioned um, he I'm trying to think of, like who I can compare him to and I was thinking of like you know um, Anthony Hopkins as um, Hannibal Lecter you know they're completely different I guess I don't know but how iconic he is like Hannibal Lecter you know Anthony Hopkins very iconic horror figure or whatever and I'm not saying that Blue Velvet's a horror but you know as a psycho a very iconic psycho kind of person and this should just be more widely known like this should be more highly regarded because it's just phenomenal there are scenes where Jeffrey goes to actually see um, the singer and somehow he's drinking there. I think he's underage, I don't know. <laughs> he's drinking beer, but he's drinking Heineken. He's like, Heineken, he's drinking with Sandy, too. It's like, Heineken's the best beer, or whatever. Well, um, when Frank captures him, Frank's like, what kind of beer do you like, or whatever? What do you like to drink? And he's like, Heineken. He's like, Heineken, screw that! Paps Blue Ribbon! <laughs> he's like... Everything that he does is like way over the top. Um, there's a lot of stuff that he says that I won't even won't even repeat. It's, it's just so crazy. Um, I, I wanted to mention how my mom reacted to this movie. The one main thing that my mom that stood out to me about my mom watching it is when he um, snuck into her room, her apartment for the first time. Um, and she's walking up there or whatever my mom's like get out of there get out of there and he gets in the he hides in the closet where she's like what are you doing hiding in the closet like get out of there you need to get out of there um, and then like she walks through the living room and she like takes off her wig which is kind of weird because you you think to me anyway you, you think that like her hair is like natural like she has this long dark hair but she like takes it off and it's a wig and she's got shorter hair underneath of it <coughs> but I guess, you know, she's a show woman or whatever, but, but she goes back to, like, her bedroom, and my mom's like, get out of the closet, like, this is the time to leave, you know, get out of there, like, my mom gets animated sometimes with movies, and this is one of those times, but it's like, mom, calm down, jeez, but anyway, oh, I loved it, and I'm very, very glad that I got to share that, I could watch this movie, and like I said, the, the Sandman song and the scene where they play that. Uh, it's like the KD code if I have to call the Sandman. Something like that. But he's like, in dreams, I walk with you. Like the Sandman. And Frank's like quoting that after he gets punched by Jeffrey and they stop. It's like, it's like shadow. scene at the end where there's a bird and maybe it wasn't Doves talks about this dream that she had. Maybe it's Robin. So it is a Robin. It has the beetle in its mouth. And I told you at the beginning of the movie how it kinda goes to this sinister like underground insect world and there's like beetles. And this kind of gives you, I think, like the symbolism of like victory because like the Robin or whatever that she was talking about that was like this you know, holy dream that she had uh, is now like eating the insect. That's just, it's interesting. Room 710 is the room where she stays. That's the apartment. This is inside of her apartment. That's her. Singer is a very good actress too. She's very interesting. She plays a very good distraught woman. You feel for her, um, you know, and how, like I said, how she's kind of demented herself from the abuse. This is basically his view. He's in the closet. This is the view.
There is a scene where they have sex and then you help like see if you know something. But basically they do sleep together. I guess I kinda of forgot to mention that. I said they're kind of romantically involved, but they do uh, sleep together and he actually gets her that point because she wants him to hit her. I don't remember if she like says something that was said with her and I actually hit her blood, but this is the scene where they're in bed together. Welcome to Lumberjack. Um, I was trying to think if Roger and Shooter gave us a good point of view. Not that it would matter. I mean, their opinions are the best. I think they do. I think it's a good You get a good performance from her, uh, the suburban roaming or something. I'm just thinking of the blue belt song. Now here's his friend that's singing like Katie Miller. Oh yeah, he's not even singing into a... I said there's a spotlight on him, he's singing into a light on the microphone. And I mean, just his expressions and his pale, I guess his face is like pale. That's what I was trying to say with the makeup. Expressions are weird again, some over the top expressions. Like, this is just like nightmare. It's just this guy just singing this in the full light. It's surreal. There is the ear. Let's go listen to the ear. Here's the ear he found. Dad is Frank. Look at the crazy eyes. He also kind of has this coolness edge to him, though. Like I said, he kind of has a gang of buddies, and he drinks, and he has uh, this nice car, and he uh, wears like a leather jacket and stuff, so he's completely psycho, but he kind of has like, this, this cool kind of thing. And there's Sandy and Jeffrey. Not even long enough, really. I guess five hours or something. Um, <clears throat> there's some women when they're there with that guy singing that song. There's some women there. They're sitting there and they're kind of surreal. Kind of got this vintage vibe. Hairspray. Kind of like. There is Jeffrey after he gets beat up. Uh, Great punch for making the car. Kyle McFarland. This is the singer again. She's all makeup there, but I think that's kind of what she's like. Psycho. Amazing. Now this is why this is what makes the Criterion so great. It has a lot of extras that I can watch through. Just the packaging David Lynch is blessed to have a lot of criteria on a lot of his movies and criteria, hopefully all of them. I think that's one of the reasons why I'm biased to the criteria. I could go on, um, I guess I could read the back of it and we can talk about the trailer that's playing behind me too. It says, home from college, okay, I guess it's college, it's said high school, whatever, okay, so maybe he's old enough to drink, maybe, whatever, I don't know why, I was in high school. Home from college, Jeffrey Dumont, played by Kyle McLaughlin, makes an unsettling discovery of severed human ear, lying in the field, and like I said, how everything happy at the end again. I think also his dad's there. His dad's uh, fine again, so. But he finds a ear, and the mystery that follows by turns terrifying and darkly funny. Writer-director David Lynch burrows deep beneath the picturesque surfaces of small town life. Driven to investigate, Jeffrey finds himself drawing closer to his fellow amateur 
include Sandy Williams, played by Laura Dern, as well as their person of interest, lounge singer Dorothy Balance, played by Isabella Rosamond, and facing the fury of Frank Lou, played by Dennis Hopper, a psychopath who will stop at nothing to keep Dorothy in his grasp. With intense performances and constant scenes. Like I said, yeah, it's a very dark movie, literally and figuratively, and uh, it's as terrifying. Just the looks on Frank's face are terrifying. But uh, when the mother gets reunited, like with her son at the end, it's really, it's really sad. You know, really feel good. Moment. So you see him hiding in the closet there, that's, you know, one of Frank's big facial expressions that's, uh, creepy. So there was also this, like I said how Frank had this deal with this bad cop or whatever, there was also some guy that was dressed nice, this well-dressed man or whatever that was there. And at the end, when Frank comes to the apartment and Jeffrey shoots him, he's dressed up as this well-dressed man with a fake mustache and like in a suit and stuff it's weird I think he's wearing like a wig or something it's it's part of David Lynch's surreal stuff it's like what in the hell is this like um well Tom McClocken also gets on that police radio or whatever because it's there with that bad guy who's standing there who's like dead or whatever I heard that David Lynch read a story like a real life story about someone who died like and they were still standing because of gravity because of their balance or whatever so he like put that in his movie it's just weird it's just that's what david lynch does it's just weird and also just makes you speculate too like maybe he isn't dead what happened we don't really even know what happened in that way police officers involvement there well anyways jeffrey gets on the radio and tells him that Frank is coming after him because he sees him coming out of the apartment. He's like, he's dressed as the well-dressed man. And then he gets the idea that Frank also has the police radio, and he, so he can hear what's going on. He can hear what's being said. <laughs> so he decides to distract him, or, or to, to get him off his trail or whatever. He's like, I'm going to hide like in the bedroom. So he puts like the radio in the bedroom, but then he goes into the closet in the living room. And when Frank comes in, he's like, I have the radio, you idiot. Like, I heard everything you said. He's like, one well-dressed man coming to kill you or whatever. I don't know. He's got, like, a pistol with, like, a silencer. Yeah, like I said before that, there's, like, the shootout scene with these cops and, and his thugs. And they're just, and cops are getting shot and killed or whatever. Now, that's crazy. But it's just, it's, it's so wonderfully bizarre and beautiful and dark. And like I said, just the way that it's filmed, the angles of the rooms, the angles, the lighting, the ideas that are portrayed, you know, from the mind of David Lynch comes a modern day masterpiece, so startling, so provocative, it went away too fast for me to read the rest. <laughs> you can look at the trailer yourself. You need to watch this movie if you haven't seen this. If it sounds interesting at all to you, check it out. You won't be disappointed. It's different, but it's still easy to follow. You're going to be surprised that you've never seen or heard of this before. Just go buy the Criterion Collection. Just go buy it now. You won't regret it. Show it to all your friends and your family. Alright guys, that's going to be it. God bless. Thanks for watching. Let me know what you think if you've seen this. Uh, it's just uh, the performances just blow me away. So I'm very pleased, very happy with this movie. <coughs> Alright, God bless guys. Have a good one.